Dreams in every country. Dreams, you know we can work together and learn what we need to meet the challenge. Hello, and welcome to the ISA Conference Rewind video podcast series. I'm Tanisha Price, instructional designer with the International Society of Arboriculture. Today, ISA is proud to bring you a presentation by Craig Bachman about why professional contract climbers are an untapped training resource. This talk was originally given at the 2021 ISA virtual conference, so the views seen here are those of the presenter. I hope you will enjoy this presentation on contract climbers. All right, hello and welcome. My name is Craig Bachman. Uh, this is Contract Climbers, an untapped training resource. Uh, I'm excited to be with you for the ISA 2021 virtual conference. Uh, it'd be nice to see each other in person, but uh, it was not to be this year, but glad to be with you this way and uh, looking forward to seeing you all next year in person. So let's get started. Again, my name is Craig Bachman. I'm the lead arborist and manager of Tree 133. We are a tree preservation company based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I'm a certified arborist, certified tree worker, uh, certified tree care safety professional. Uh, more importantly, uh, I used to be a contract climber and I, as a business owner, hire contract climbers from now and, and again. And that's really the origin of this presentation. Uh, it's really a a conversation about training, about utilizing resources that we have available to improve the skills and competency of our teams, of our employees performing tree work in the field. So let's get started. The fact is that providing training is hard. It's really difficult. I've been a professional skill and safety trainer myself. And I will tell you that training employees within my own company is much harder than being a trainer. You know, the schedule is busy. There just aren't that many training options. You know, I, I'm hoping that they'll figure it out on their own. The fact is sending people to courses is expensive. And, and for many of us, uh, we just say, you know what? I'm not a trainer. I, I know the skills, but teaching or training is not my skill set. Interestingly, arboriculture for me is a second career. I previously was a trainer. I worked in the world of professional skills. So I was a trainer. So I come to this from a little bit of different perspective. But I will tell you, as a business owner, that is my focus, running the operation and training is only one part of what I do. So I'm always looking for ways to improve the skills of my team, to provide better training, to lift uh, their competencies so that we as a company can be better and more effective. And let's talk about some ways we can do that here today. The fact is there is so much that we need our employees to learn, whether it is tree biology, PPE and PPA, personal protective equipment and apparel, friction devices, driving trucks, carabiners, chainsaws, pole tools, there's a million different subjects, or at least it feels like a million, that we need to learn to be effective, safe, and efficient in our boriculture, whether we are climbers, whether we are aerial lift operators, whether we are performing uh, tree injections as part of a plant healthcare program, whatever it might be, there is a ton to learn. And the question is, how are we going to learn that all? And what I want to share with you is something called the 70 20 10 rule the 70 20 10 rule has to do with how do uh, employees workers in skill oriented jobs learn those skills how do they develop the knowledge and skills to perform their jobs at a high level and that learning research has found comes in three areas about 10 percent of that information comes from courses whether it's webinars like these, self-study, uh, going to workshops, other kinds of uh, structured classroom type learning experiences, about 10% of that. 20% comes from other people, 
learning by interacting with conversations, discussions, uh, ways in which we learn interpersonally. That's about 20% of the learning we do. But the big one on the right-hand side there is 70% of the learning comes from on-the-job experiences and challenges. In many ways, we learn by doing. You may have heard the term kinesthetic learners. Tree workers, myself and probably you, arborists, are generally kinesthetic learners. We learn by having ourselves involved. We learn by doing, not just by watching or hearing or reading. And this is proved out by research conducted over 30 years focused on how do employees learn, grow, and develop through their careers. And again, that big point is 70% of learning takes place on the job. And maybe that's not a big surprise, but it's important to recognize that it's not 100%, right? That other 30 has to come from somewhere, but 70% is a crucial large majority of where learning comes from. And it's particularly important for kinesthetic learners. It helps us create a highly skilled workforce. And what it leads us to is the opportunity to set the expectation that employees will continue learning and growing. You know, this profession continues to evolve, whether it is climbing techniques, pruning knowledge, plant healthcare uh, expertise, we continue to evolve every year, every decade, and learning must continue with that or we get behind. So what's interesting going further is that research tells us that the best way to learn is by doing it. That's what we just spoke about. It makes a lot of sense. That's probably been your experience as well. And yet, Experiential learning, learning by doing, is where we as companies provide the least support. We seem to think that it will just happen on its own. I put you in the field with people who know things and you absorb that information by being told what to do or some such you know, concept. But the fact is we don't plan very well how on the job learning is gonna take place. So what can we do to make it better? Well, obviously, we can plan better. We can create a structure for on-the-job training. We can use methods for assessing the skill sets of our employees, of our teams. And we can use reinforcement, ways to reiterate, strengthen, uh, review key information on a regular basis. But there's a piece missing from that, and that's what we're going to focus on today. And that missing piece is leadership. The crucial way that we can improve training in the field is by improving or enhancing leadership. So in your company, who is it that leads on the job training? Who is it in the field that makes sure that John or Sue or Paul or whomever, the new employee, the new to your company tree worker or arborist, who is it that makes sure they learn what they need, that they are learning the right way rather than the wrong way? You know, is it you, the business owner? Maybe it's your crew leader or your foreman. Often it's the most experienced, quote unquote, the most experienced person on the crew. Man, that person's not always necessarily even the one in charge, are they? We've all seen it that the one, the one who talks the loudest, the one who's been around the longest, is the one who seems to have the greatest influence on the rest of the crew. Maybe your company has a dedicated trainer or safety specialist, particularly for larger you know, regional or uh, national companies. They often have those resources, but most of us do not. Generally, it falls to whoever is the foreman or the business owner in the case of a very small company. And what we need to understand is this concept called the law of the lid comes from a great book, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John C. Maxwell. Uh, terrific book, uh, awesome audio book. If you spend a lot of time driving between jobs, or maybe you're, maybe you're a business owner or a, out, uh, a supervisor moving between different crews, this 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership is a great audio book. It's very concise. 
Anyhow, the point of the law of the lid is that leadership ability is the lid, the limit, that determines a person's effectiveness. And the example that he gives in the book is of a sports team and a sports franchise that is, that is sold, goes to new ownership. And what do they do first? They improve the coaching. Whether they get a new coach, they add a new offensive coordinator, whoever it might be. And that the coach, the leader, is the lid on that organization. And the same is true in our tree companies, whether it is us as owners or managers, or it is our uh, foreman, for person, or crew leader out in the field. The development of your team is limited by the knowledge, skills, and teaching ability of that leader in the field. Said simply, the skill set and communication of that leader in the field, the one who is influencing driving that training, is what guides and limits or unlimits the development of your team. If the leadership ability in the field is low, the result is a stagnant safety culture. We lack exposure to new ideas. We end up not knowing what we don't know. And we've all seen this concept, the big fish in the small pond, the, uh, the worker who is convinced he or she knows everything because he or she has more experience than the three other people he's worked with over the last several years. And so how can we lift the lid? How can we expand, improve, enhance the training that happens in the field for your employees? We do it by cross-pollination. And I really like this graphic. <laughs> I like this picture. It comes from KathleenAllen.net and a wonderful article uh, that she has called What Bees Can Teach Us About the Pollination of Ideas. Uh, but what I think is really cool about this picture is this bee is flying in and, uh, and it has all of this pollen on it already. And it's coming into this next flower where there's other different pollen. And it's going to mingle that pollen together. Think of it as mixing ideas, cross-pollinating ideas. That concept of cross-pollination, of bringing in new ideas, is critical to elevating on-the-job training. Otherwise, we become stagnant. We become uh, like plants without cross-pollination. They become inbred, or they don't fruit or flower at all. So cross-pollination, and how do we bring new ideas into your company? I want to talk to you about this opportunity of a dynamic that's happening in our profession and how you can take advantage of it. You may have observed there's more and more independent arborists, small companies, individuals working on a part-time basis for multiple, uh, multiple companies. Maybe they're working on large projects in California or on the East Coast. Maybe they are traveling internationally, working on contracts here and there. Uh, there's a growing number of very skilled, experienced arborists who are working outside of our normal sort of business or corporate structures. They have lots of experience working in different regions, working for companies of different sizes, performing a variety of different tasks and roles within our profession of arboriculture. They are trained in safe modern work practices. They have been exposed to these high standards, these modern techniques. Many of them have been involved in climbing competitions. Many of them have been in training roles or safety roles, large projects where the expectations are difficult than at the typical small company. They have leadership experience and proven communication skills. They have worked with many different people. They are used to communicating with crews that they don't know well, rather than just being in the same environment every day of the week. And as I said, many of them have specific qualifications around safety and training because they've needed them. They have been in other kinds of roles. And right now they're in this sort of independent role. Maybe they're thinking of starting their own company, 
but they're looking for opportunities to do more than just show up to work each day and climb a tree. And so what do we call these people? We call them contract climbers. Now, when you hear the term contract climber, what does that mean? Well, there's some old ways of looking at it. You know, it's easy to describe a, a contract climber using the old stereotypes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He just does production. He just wants to go out and kill trees, just does removals. That guy won't drag brush. Uh, he's not a team player. You know, here in the U.S., he just works for cash, whatever it is. It's, uh, he's expensive. Uh, those are old stereotypes around contract climbers. And uh, back, you know, a number of years ago when I was contract climbing, you know, I ran into those a lot. And you can uh, sort of see those coming. And that there's this uh, this attitude about, oh yeah, no, you're different. You're you're not what we do here. Oh, I, we would never hire somebody like that. And there's these assumptions made about people. So these old stereotypes about what is a contract climber, I think we have to move beyond those because that doesn't accurately describe some of these individuals who are out in the market these days looking to do more, who have a high level of skill. So we have to have a new paradigm. And that new paradigm is, this is, I think, perhaps the most important thing that I can share with you today, which is when we think about contract climbers, and I'll tell you not all of them, but we'll define that a little bit. When we talk about professional contract climbers, they can be an incredible resource to your company as a trainer and mentor. An outside expert who comes in and works with your crew, cross-pollinating ideas, right? Remember that picture with the bee flying in with all the pollen on it? You know, leading by example and raising the performance of your team. Now, I, I don't do contract climbing anymore. I just don't have time with growing my business. Uh, but I want to share one example from my own experience about leading by example. And that is around the concept of using two hands when operating a chainsaw, particularly you know, with a top handle saw up in the tree. While most, I would say, tree workers and arborists are aware that the safety standard and the manufacturer's requirement is that saws are operated with two hands, not everybody's aware of that, but that is a safety principle that is violated regularly. And a lot of that happens because Workers are not, what do I want to say? They have not had the example set for them. It's not been demonstrated to them that that can be done efficiently and safely and consistently. And so in leading by example, what I wanted to share with you is when I was contract climbing with other companies, I made a point to demonstrate in everything that I did that I was using the best practice that I was operating the chainsaw with two hands, that I was working diligently to be positioned properly, secured two ways at least before making my saw cuts, and that I was using two hands every time. And that leading by example brought up so many interesting conversations where sincerely in the middle of a job, a company that I was contracting with perhaps, somebody on the ground would shout up to me and be like, Hey, do you do that every time? So what do you mean? But do you always use two hands on that song? Well, yeah, of course I do. That's the safety standard. And it sort of blew their mind sometimes where they had not been exposed to that. They had not seen someone actually do it. They had maybe read it, maybe been told it, maybe they had you know, heard about it as, oh yeah, you're supposed to. But actually seeing someone live that practice of two hands on the saw, use that every time. Leading by example in that way made a huge impact on crews that I worked with. And when we talk about this new paradigm for contract climbers, that's a great example of what it can be, is elevating standards, showing what can be done and how things should be done. It raises team performance. Now, just as a quick sidebar, we use the term contract climber just broadly. Whether this person is a part-time employee or hired in a subcontract way, that's not what this is all about. There's a variety of different hiring scenarios depending on 
where you're located in your local regulations. But the fact is that investing in bringing in a contract climber can be a really smart choice for your business as a way to improve training, among other things. And so let's defer, excuse me, let's define this term professional contract climber. It's someone who shares new skills and techniques, demonstrates safe work practices, like the saw example we gave you. Maybe it's climbing systems, maybe it's rigging techniques, maybe it's distribution of forces, maybe it is job site setup. Someone who can facilitate gear inspections, lead hands-on practice, provide coaching to your team in the field, sharing feedback to you as the company owner or leader on observations from the job site, or mentoring high aptitude employees. You know, sometimes when we're providing training, we are teaching to the lowest common denominator. <laughs> maybe not sometimes, maybe that's a lot of the time, where we are trying to up the, up the level of our lower performers, trying to get everyone to work in a safe manner, trying to get everyone to understand something that part of the team maybe already gets and the rest of them are lagging behind. But bringing in a high performer, someone like a professional contract climber, has the ability to work with members of your team at all different levels and to be not only a leader and teacher, but to be a mentor to help your high aptitude skilled employees go to that next level as well and inspire the whole team to further learning. You remember we spoke earlier about the 70-20-10 rule and how recognizing the importance of on-the-job experiential training and investing in that to improve it can help create a foundation and set the expectation for long-term learning and growth. And this cross-pollination, this bringing in an outside person who can be a trainer, who can be an on-the-job leader to cross-pollinate ideas can help continue to set that standard for growth and inspiring future learning. And what's interesting about this contract climber model is they help complete jobs efficiently as well. We're not going out of the field. We are not sitting in a classroom. We're not just in the yard looking at a new piece of equipment. We're out in the field performing work. And whether it is uh, you know, pruning or removal, maybe we're focusing on setting up the job site. Maybe we are talking about chainsaw safety. Maybe we are whatever the subject may be, installing climbing lines, preparing for aerial rescue, whatever it might be, every moment of that is a potential learning opportunity. And it's getting work done at the same time. There are so many things that can be taught, improved, assessed, provided feedback, whether it is job site setup, technical rigging, crane operations. We've talked about many of these already. The fact is every job site has a million learning opportunities and having a professional contract climber with leadership and communication skills who can set high standards, provide coaching, observe and provide feedback to your team and to you as the business owner provides so much value in potentially all of these areas. And so how do we measure the value? How do we know if this is a good idea? if contract climbers, hiring a professional contract climber really pays off for a business. Uh, so I reached out to someone I had worked with a number of years ago, and his name is Alan. And I said, Alan, how did you decide to hire me or other contract climbers? And how did you determine what the value was that you received? How do you know that was a good idea? I'll share with you what he passed along. He said that hiring a professional contract climber enables them to tackle complex projects with an emphasis on quality, safety, and efficiency. He valued that modeling of safe behavior best practices and providing feedback around the thought process and the approach to the work. And what he specifically called out is that bringing in that outside expert, that a uh, professional contract climber, our cross-pollinator, provided both training and that business outcome of a profitable job. 
So in his experience, hiring contract climbers as a trainer, as a job resource, the value was substantial in terms of training as well as for the business. And so let's talk through some of the key points from what we've hit today. We have this opportunity of a growing number of independent arborists who have knowledge, skills, experience, leadership abilities. They've been exposed to all kinds of different projects at different scales. They are these cross-pollinators who can be an incredible resource to your company. This is a growing opportunity in our profession. Men and women with a high level of skill looking to contribute in new ways. And the fact is, particularly for small companies, we're not necessarily in a position to hire these people full-time, but on a part-time basis, a contract basis, they can bring great value to our companies. As leaders in the field to help us, our crew leaders, help our entire com company lift the lid, improve our on-the-job training. The fact is we have to move beyond the old stereotypes of contract climbers and utilize this resource to improve the skills, knowledge, competency of our crews, to mentor and inspire our top performers, to improve safety on the job site. And the fact is that this cross-pollinator, this contract climber resource, can be a mentor and can provide inspiration to the crews to encourage them to continue pursuing knowledge. That training can become something that is not top down, that is not something that is pushed on them or required, but that it is inspired, that it moves training into something where they are, uh, the learning process is initiated and sparked by these experiences and encourages your crew to be pursuing knowledge uh, and bringing it to the company as well, Ele elevating their own careers, elevating the skill of your entire team. The end result is that professional contract climbers can improve safety and skills for your company. They can help cross-pollinate knowledge, lift the lid on your training, and in the end, provide an excellent value because you receive high quality training, leadership, mentorship, and the business advantage of getting work done profitably at the same time. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you today. Again, my name is Craig Bachman, lead arborist and manager with Tree 133 in Seattle, Washington, and looking forward to seeing you all in person again soon. Thank you. Trees in every country Trees, you know we can Work together and learn what we need To meet the challenge